contained in your scripture tonight. I feel badly for the guys that are on the platform when they try to leave and I come charging up. They never know which way is safe to go. <laughs> Brother Chris used to be here. He used to jump back sometimes. He really makes some great moves. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week, uh, we, we really began in this portion of the Scripture, which it turns the corner in this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and where he begins to address, it's not only a doctrinal matter, but a very, very personal matter, a matter of hope, and that is the matter of eternal life or life after death. And it is, I'll tell you, friend, if you have not lost someone dear to you, you will. And uh, the truths that are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 are so much more meaningful. I, I've had the privilege of preaching a number of funerals over the years. And uh, matter of fact, probably some of the first places I ever preached were funerals, family funerals. And I've come to the place where it's the, one of the places that I'd rather preach the gospel more than anything else because the gospel is such a message of hope. One of the things that I've discovered in preaching at funerals is that most people at a funeral, if they don't firmly believe in eternal life, life after death, they certainly hope. They certainly hope that there is a life after death. And uh, back in the, oh, I don't know, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a lot of churches in the fundamental <coughs> movement would use three words to, to describe their preaching. They'd talk about the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. And really that is, as a believer, one of the foundational important truths. And that is one that gives us perspective in life, that, if, that we're eternal. Matter of fact, uh, and, and I'm just sharing some thoughts with you, this isn't part of the message this evening, but I'd encourage you when you share the gospel to um, try to jump ahead to some conclusions instead of trying to argue your way to get there. Just go ahead and tell people you know that you're going to be somewhere forever. And just go ahead and start off the conversation with people like that. Say, so, you know, you you know that the loved ones that you've lost are somewhere. That they didn't just disappear, they didn't just cease to exist, they didn't just go into the ground. And what you're doing when you do that is that you are actually um, claiming a, a, a truth of the scripture that's in Romans chapter one. That first of all, we know that there's a God. And we know the nature of the Godhead. And God's eternal. And that is the whole premise of what we looked at last week. In other words, the entire premise for the resurrection is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so we know that in the church that Paul is addressing, of course, factions uh, of believers who, um, if what they thought doctrinally were true, would have believed in vain. And that would be the Sadducees in the church, people that believed that there was no resurrection, that we just go into the ground. You say, Pastor, can someone really be saved if they don't believe in the resurrection? Well, it would seem as though there were believers in the church at Corinth that didn't believe in the resurrection. You know, individuals can get off or get, get away from truth, from orthodoxy. It's one of the important things to recognize uh, about the word apostasy. Apostasy is going away from and so it implies having truth. You know, people don't get saved into false doctrine when they're originally saved. Salvation is just simple. The gospel is simple. There's no theologian. Uh, well, I, 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 that's, that's a blanket statement. It's untrue. There's no theologian outside of Reformation, guys, <laughs> that uh, get saved uh, and uh, have a lot of knowledge of doctrine. And usually when they do, they're all backward. I, I'm thinking specifically of Martin Luther when he really discovered that salvation was by faith, and that uh, justification was by faith. And I believe Martin Luther was saved. And, uh, but his, his doctrine was just all wacky, all backward when he came to Jesus. You know, most people that get saved are just brand new believers. And they couldn't articulate all of the doctrines of the Scripture and explain everything and answer everything in a correct way, but they believe. And sometimes believers get led astray. And they get taken different directions. And those are the individuals that Paul was, was talking to in the church at Corinth. And, you know, it's, there's one last thing I want to say about that. It's futile to argue with somebody who's bent on a direction. Mm -hmm. 
or who's, who's going to believe what they believe no matter what. That's a waste of time. And I don't think Paul was so naive as to write this letter to the church at Corinth. How say some of you that there's no resurrection of the dead? And to address the people saying there's no resurrection from the dead, Paul wasn't just wasting his time writing a letter to people that weren't willing to hear it. They just were wrong. And they needed to be helped with it. And in their being helped with it, we've been helped by it as well, haven't we? I've met Christians that have said, well, you know, and it's, you know, they just they just have moments of weakness in their faith. They just I don't know, you know, if I believe in life after death. You say, Pastor, are they saved? Well, the answer is the same about them as anyone I know. I don't know. I can't look into the heart of a person and tell uh, what's there. But I know that they're wrong doctrinally. I know that they're wrong about what they believe. And so last week we saw specifically uh, that it was positively affirmed that there is a resurrection. And the proof of it was that Christ is risen. Do you remember that the portion that we emphasized, spent a lot of time on last week, the three verses, verse 2, verse 14, and verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 15, when we talked about your belief being in vain? And I think it's real helpful for us to take that away in this portion of the Scripture because a lot of people talk about believing in vain in the sense that they make it the person who believes has believed in vain. But actually, the premise of what Paul is saying is has nothing to do with their faith being in vain. It has to do with the object of their, with their faith being in vain because of the object. In other words, if Jesus isn't risen, according to verse 7, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. In other words, the reason your faith is vain isn't because you don't believe or you don't believe the right way. It's because you're believing something that isn't so. And of course, Paul begins the passage of Scripture affirming the gospel, which he said he believed. That is that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And was seen of witnesses, was seen of Cephas, was seen of the twelve, was seen of 500 witnesses, the greater part, that were alive unto this present when Paul penned this, this letter. And then he said, last of all, he was seen by me also as of one born out of due time. I love it also, we saw last week, and again, I just want to lead us into our text in case you don't remember where we were at that Paul emphasized that he was saved the same way as everyone else. You ever have someone that wants to debate about whether or not God uh, sovereignly ordained Paul's salvation when he was on the road? And, uh, you know, when God said, Who art thou, Lord? Or I mean, sorry, when, when he saw the bright light, saw Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he saw, Who art thou? No, Paul said, This is the gospel which we have received. And then he emphasized that it was the same gospel that the other apostles preached as well. So this is a really rich text. 1 Corinthians 15 really settles a lot of things doctrinally. You say, Pastor, I've never even heard people debate or discuss those things. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so glad that you haven't had to deal with a lot of nonsense and foolishness. Uh, preach the gospel <laughs> instead of arguing about what the gospel is, and you'll be better for it. But in case you run into it, 1 Corinthians 15 is just full of these nuggets. And sometimes if you're a thinker, you'll have these questions. You'll ask the question, did Paul, did Paul believe in Jesus by choice? Or was he just sort of forced into the ministry uh, because he had no choice, he couldn't resist God? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 answers that question. Paul answers it himself, and he talks about the gospel which he himself had received. That is, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And it's the same gospel the other apostles preached. Okay, let's read our text tonight. We'll get started with our message. Now we're only half an hour in. Okay? Um, Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and, all, and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Paul said, when he says manifest, basically he's saying it's obvious that Jesus wasn't put under his feet. He's an exception to putting all things under his feet. In verse 28, When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all, 
are almost done. Hang in there. Verse 29, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? <clears throat> why are they then baptized for the dead? Another argument. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of man I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Father, please help us as we go into the Scripture this evening to glean some truths. Lord, I know it is certainly impossible with a text this size to pull everything out of here that we could understand and could be helped by. But it's important for us this evening to have that blessed hope and to have an understanding of the greatness of our resurrected Savior. And I ask that those would be the things that we would glean in particular this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I, we're not going to get back to verse 33, and so I just want to deal with it here, just, just mention it right now. It'll be another good scripture memory verse for you. But this is one of those verses that oftentimes get memorized out of context, isn't it? Evil communications, corrupt good manners. Usually the second part of it is. Specifically what Paul is alluding to here is that if you communicate or you teach the wrong thing, it corrupts good behavior. In other words, it has a corrupt behavior behind it. Certainly philosophies that don't believe in eternal consequences, philosophies of living which reject eternal consequence do corrupt good behavior, don't they? There's no morality for a person that doesn't believe in life after death. There is only whatever moral fabric society forces on a person in order to inhibit them from doing what they would do if they could get away with it if they don't believe in life after death. Paul points out, you know, sort of a hedonism, a uh, hedonistic mindset here when he says, eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In other words, if this is all there is, then get what you can. And uh, who cares how long it lasts? Because nothing lasts. And that sort of behavior does affect it. You know, some Christians live that way, don't they? Some believers, unfortunately, live as though there's no eternal life. Friend, if I could impress you with one thing that would help you in a way that you'd be grateful for eternity for, it would be with the reality that not only is there eternal life, but there is eternal reward. You know, a lot of believers just completely overlook the reality that this life is a vapor and eternity is forever, and, but that what we do in this life matters forever. We were reminded before when we looked at the works that are done in our bodies and the time that those things that we've done are going to burn and there's going to be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And the wood, hay, and the stubble are going to burn up. I'm constantly frustrated each year of my life as I evaluate my passing days. I'm frustrated by the reality of things that must be done but which I think are probably mostly wood, hay, and stubble. I don't know what percentage of my life has been wood, hay, and stubble, but I need to get some gold, silver, and precious stones. You know how long that'll last? Forever. And so the bad behavior that comes doctrinally from not believing in the resurrection would be living for this life as though it is the means to the end instead of an end to the means. Did I say that the right way? I hope I did. If, uh, if I didn't phrase it the right way and you understand how it should be, make sure to tell everybody how it should be later on. Or you can see the guy in the yellow shirt. I'm sure he knows. I love the shirt, Brother Duke. Hey, I want to tell you, this guy, do you golf? You do golf a little bit, don't you? But he likes to fish, so he's, he is a man. And so in case you're looking at his golf shirt, see, golf shirts work really well for door-to-door. -door, so he's a good guy, even though he's wearing a mustard-colored yellow shirt. He, goes, he likes to go fishing. Nobody ever takes him, but he likes it when he goes. You're more of a fisherman than a golfer, aren't you? Yes. Okay, good confession. All right. Well, let's uh, move forward some more into our text. Actually, let's move back to verse uh, 20. I want to look at a word that sort of baffles me. Uh, I shouldn't say baffles, but as I'm studying for the text, a word that kind of jumps out and makes me wonder, what does this mean? This is verse 20. It's the word first fruits. 
But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And matter of fact, you see the word first fruits again down in verse 23. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. I did some really interesting reading on this text. And I, I would share it all with you if, uh, if two conditions were met. The first condition that would need to be met would be my memory, if I could remember everything I read. That would be the first condition. You say, Pastor, uh, you should have uh, should have put it up on the screen or something so we could read it. Yeah, you could stay home and read stuff. You don't need to come here and read stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and the second thing about it is, just like everything good that you read, sometimes you wonder if it's true or not. But the gist of one of the things that I read, and I thought was interesting, and I thought may be helpful in understanding the text, and I'm just not sure, I'm not convinced that this is where Paul is going, but certainly he would have been fully aware of as a good Pharisee, is the differences in the um, first fruits and the celebration in the calendar of the first fruits for the Sadducees and for the Pharisees. And as I understand it, the day that Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the, the day that the, the in Matthew chapter 27, let's just turn that real quick. I'll read it to you because I'll describe it all wrong. But uh, the day that the saints came out of the graves, and, and I wanted to, I wanted to uh, just go here because of a couple of reasons. One of the reasons being that there are a lot of things that believers just don't know. Um, about the difference between uh, hell and the lake of fire and paradise and heaven, and those sort of things which you would find in, um, in, in Scripture. Uh, I want to just allude to them this evening. Let me see if I can find here the passage that I'm looking for. And I'm looking for when the saints came out of the graves. And... What? 52. Oh, thank you. There it is. Okay, so let's look at verse 50. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, uh, according to a guy that was in, I don't, even, I don't remember who, so I don't have to cite this well. But according to a guy who worked with an archaeologist excavating graves around Jerusalem, there are uh, three rings, basically, of burial graves outside of Jerusalem. And this would probably be a reference to the third, which would be furthest outside of the city. Matter of fact, several miles outside of the city. And the way that the Sadducees and the Pharisees would celebrate the first fruits of the harvest where they go out and they take the harvest and they bring in their first sheaves, their first fruits, and they bring it to the temple and they would offer it and the high priest would wave the, uh, the whatever the thingy dingy is, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> but, uh, and he would wave it and he would receive it. Well, the day that this would have happened would be the day the Pharisees would have been going out to cut or harvest, or, I mean not the Pharisees, the Sadducees would have been out going out to harvest their first fruits. In other words, this celebration of the feast of the first fruits, this celebration day, would have been the day when Jesus died at this moment. There would have been people going out of Jerusalem, going uh, toward where the graves are for the harvest to cut their sheaves and bring them back. And uh, in their face are saints. In other words, Grandpa, we buried you 20 years ago. And he's heading into Jerusalem. What, what are you doing here? We put you in the grave. In other words, there would be a lot of these saints coming into Jerusalem, coming from the graves outside of Jerusalem. While the Sadducees are coming, coming out of Jerusalem, they would have celebrated on a different day than the Pharisees would have. And the resurrection would have been right in your face of the Sadducees. Now, I find that really interesting, and I haven't spent a lot of time studying it, but it's, it's an interesting uh, illusion. I think certainly the Sadducees would have been aware of that. And I think certainly uh, Paul would have been aware of the differences doctrinally between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this is no secret what Levi or Matthew recorded in Matthew chapter 27. That is, right after Jesus gave up the ghost, the saints came out of the graves. What an incredible truth that is. What an amazing thing that is. In other words, that's an evidence of the resurrection. And I believe that's an undertone of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I believe when uh, Paul is alluding to the resurrection of Jesus and saying, if Christ if be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there's no resurrection from the dead? And I believe that's the reason for the terminology of first fruits being used over and again here in this passage of Scripture. It certainly would seem to be that. Also, first fruits uh, would be something that we would uh, be given to understand here because um, of the conclusion... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let, me, let me go back to 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to go with me there, as uh, if you will. Uh, while you're going there, I'm going to read verse 54 of Matthew 27. Now when the centurion, they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And so it's a, it's a great witness of the events that surrounded the death of Christ on the cross. The veil being rent in twain. And uh, so... You know, literally, the Pharisees thinking we have Christ in the, we have God in the temple, God in a box, God's confined here, and the veil being ripped open, and then the Sadducees on the day they celebrate the first fruit, seeing the resurrection. It was just in your face the doctrines that they believed. Now, again, uh, Pastor, how much authority do you preach that with? Well, I don't know that much about Judaism, to be frank. With you, I'm not an expert on Sadducees, and I don't actually ever want to be, to be totally honest with you. You don't win somebody by learning their false doctrine. You win someone by learning what the truth is. And what the truth is, is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah who's prophesied in the Scripture. You can't go through all the changes and aberrations of what the, the, um, the Tanakh teaches about Jesus. You just and it just changes. You know, every century a rabbi says something new about Jesus to fit with whatever the culturally accepted thing that you can say about him is. You just can't hang with that kind of uh, discussion. Uh, but I certainly think that this is something that's very viable as far as uh, what Paul is alluding to there. And I felt like I should mention it this evening. Oftentimes I don't in something like this. But I would like to also look at what Jesus said the first fruits meant. We look again uh, to verse 20, uh, and we'll just read down again. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Of course, this is the typology of Adam in Genesis. And then we see in verse 22, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In case I don't go get there before we're finished, look at verse 47, will you? The first man is of the earth, earthy. That's Adam. Let's go back to 45 through 47. That's what I intended. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, so there is this first Adam, the one that death came from. The second Adam is Jesus. And there's a difference between the first Adam uh, being made a living soul by God, and the second one being made a quickening spirit. In other words, one was given life, the other is the giver of life. To quicken means to make alive. So the contrast between Adam, Adam was given life, and because of Adam, death came upon all men. Jesus, because of Adam, was given death, and he became the quickening spirit. That is, he is the life giver. And so it's a major contrast between the first Adam and the second Adam. And so it's, of course, a reference to who Adam is as we're introduced to him in Genesis. Now, that's a message in and of itself, and we're not going to get there this evening. I just wanted to mention that before, uh, before I neglected to include it as our natural conclusion of 20 through 22. Go back to verse 23 now. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at His coming, then cometh the end, when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Will you go with me again to uh, back to Romans? So if you're in 1 Corinthians, uh, Romans would be the book right before it. And go to chapter um, 6 of Romans, where Paul is explaining how that a believer is dead to sin. And I would like to look at, in particular, um, let's see here, where am I? Verse, verses, let's read verses 6 through 9. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, of course that being Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, 
that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Notice verse 9. This is where we wanted to come to. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. And here we find the permanence of the resurrection. The permanence of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus died for sin, but He died for sin once. And according to verse 45, Jesus, in contrast with Adam, has made a quickening spirit. So the question is, for those that have slept, that would be the wording that would be in 1 Corinthians 15. For those that have slept, if they've been quickened or made alive, on what kind of a basis have they been made alive? A temporary one or a permanent one? It's a permanent one. And, uh, you know... <laughs> I cannot find the words to be as emphatic or to emphasize eternal life as much as the text here does. It's an amazing thing that eternal life is eternal. By the way, the, the word, you know, you don't create, a lot of times people create a doctrine from a word. Eternal is actually a word you can create a lot of doctrine from or that there's a lot of doctrine in it. In other words, the very meaning of the word eternal uh, has so many implications with regard to our salvation. No person who believes you can lose your salvation believes the word eternal means what it says. And it has so many implications, but Jesus Christ has been made a quickening spirit. And the kind of life that Jesus gave was not a, well, the saints were resurrected. How many just suppose when the saints outside of Jerusalem came out of the graves, they went into Jerusalem, hung out for a while, and died again? I don't think so, do you? No. You say, Pastor, what happened? Well, I believe when Jesus ascended to heaven that the saints went with Him, perhaps they were part of the cloud, much like the cloud that's going to be well, when, when we're received uh, in the same manner that Jesus ascended, when we're going to ascend into heaven, perhaps it'll be in the same way. There'll just be a cloud that we're going to go up in, a cloud of, of witnesses, a cloud of hosts, a cloud of believers. And a little bit of a study on that word it is allowed. It is allowed that maybe we would be part of the cloud of witnesses. So I don't know if maybe Acts 1.8 is not saying specifically that Jesus, when He ascended, uh, a cloud received Him out of their sight, that the cloud was the believers. But I would assume that probably that's when the believers ascended. And so it isn't, it isn't outside the realm of possibility that the apostles witnessed that. And it's certainly, and again, I'm not creating a new doctrine. Don't go away here and, and this evening emphatically declare, Pastor Price said, and therefore it must be so, although that is a good reason to believe it. Uh, <laughs> that does not mean that that's, but it certainly is allowed in an understanding of the cloud, and a cloud is used for witnesses. And I think that probably, that's probably when the believers ascended up to heaven. Perhaps they went to heaven when, yeah, it could be when Jesus went and offered his blood. In the, in the tabernacle, uh, in the place, the holies of holies, himself, uh, offering a sacrifice of his own blood once for all. But the reality of it is that those saints are, are absent from the body, present with the Lord, I believe. Now you say, Pastor, what about the bodies of these witnesses? Well, I'm not even going to preach about that. It's in, all in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It talks about how that our uh, mortal bodies or our uh, sinful or corruptible bodies are planted in the ground and they're raised spiritual. So when we're raised, we're going to have spiritual bodies instead of corruptible bodies. You say, Pastor, how does God do that? How does God raise a corruptible, in, corrupt, incorruptible? And the answer to the question is there are just a lot of things I don't understand about how God could do. Matter of fact, just about anything God does, I don't understand how He does it because He's God. I don't know how God made the world. I don't know how God made us. I don't know how God raised up Jesus. I don't know how God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But I know what the Bible says about it. And I know what the Holy Spirit witnesses in my heart. And I know it's true. And so that's good enough for me. Amen. Uh, that's that's a, sometimes all you can know uh, but it's good to know it isn't. Listen, you'll never speak to a person who can honestly say that they know there isn't a God. Because everybody honestly knows there is a God. Unless they have refused to acknowledge Him and then they come up with an alternative. But no one's honestly said they don't believe there's a God. Everybody knows there's a God. That's a fact, and you know it. 
You say, I don't, uh, how does a person know for sure uh, that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, the witness of the Holy Ghost. The witness of the Holy Spirit. And you and I know that when we, uh, when we were born again, when we met Jesus and the Spirit of God came in us and dwelt in us, is real. And it witnesses that everything is true. You know, people can tell you stories or they can give you a narrative and they string together uh, a, a sequence of logic for you to follow. And the logic all works, but the story just is not believable because it's not true. But I want to tell you something. You read the Bible account of creation. You say, I don't know how, but it's believable. You read the Bible account of the flood. You don't know how, but it's believable. You read everything the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit of God says, uh-huh. Here's another witnessing tool. Read the Word of God to people and say, you know in your heart the Holy Spirit of God is telling you that's true. And the Holy Spirit does something really neat when you say that. He goes... And he grabs people and shakes them a little bit. And he does. I've seen the Holy Spirit of God just... Mm. It happened to me. It happened to you when you got convicted about your need for the Savior. When you saw the truth of the Word of God. I mean, the Holy Spirit just... Ugh, and just lets you know it's true. And you know, no religion has that. No, no uh, false belief has that. It's not real. But God is. And so... Uh, that isn't the message this evening. I'm going to get started on the message here in a minute or so. Uh, but uh, I want to mention that to you as well. Uh, you know what? We're out of time, aren't we? I want to look at verse... Uh, did I? Did we finish with Romans 6, 9, 6, 9? Yeah. We did? We're done with that? Do you remember, what, you remember the, the uh, point I made from that passage? I'm thinking maybe I did. It was a really good verse. I just wanted to read it. <laughs> Didn't know what to do next, so read a good verse. <laughs> uh, knowing that Christ... Oh, we are talking about the permanence. Uh, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And we were talking about eternal being eternal. The emphasis there being that uh, the finality of the work of the cross. Brother John, John shouted out Hebrews a little bit ago. And I would tell you something. Hebrews... 9, 10, 11, and uh, 12. Man, I'll tell you, they just hammer this reality home. The superiority of Jesus Christ, our high priest, who once for all went into the Holy of Holies, offered his own blood, and uh, unlike a priest who daily had to minister or serve in the temple and never sat down, symbolizing that his work was never finished, Jesus, after he offered his own blood, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God the Father because his work was done once for all. And that's what we find here it being emphasized as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So go there and we'll finish up this evening. Uh, we look at order and again the word first fruits in verse 23. Every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So what's the next event on God's calendar? The resurrection of the believers. In other words, us. We are next. We're the next order of events. Uh, on God's calendar. Whether it is, as yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, or whether it's being caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and forever being with the Lord. But we're not going to prevent, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, them that are asleep. Why? Because uh, they're, going to, they're going to be resurrected from the ground. Their bodies are going to be resurrected. Just as the saints in Jerusalem in Matthew 27 are accounted to have come out of the tombs and gone into the city, uh, the saints which sleep in Jesus are going to come out of the graves and they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to meet. We're, all, we're just all going to have a meeting right there when Jesus comes and uh, calls us up. This is not the same second coming as referred to later in this text when Jesus Christ comes to judge the world. But this is when the saints are called up or when they're resurrected. And this is so vitally important for us believers. You know, there are some things that are just practical application that we can take home here tonight. There's a lot here. There's a lot of doctrine. I just, It's just like we just couldn't dive deep enough and we wouldn't have enough time. But let me just give you a couple of things that you need to take home this week and you need to use. First of all, hope. Hope. That is the blessed hope. Uh, there is there is a resurrection. I don't know how many times uh, now? I, I you know I'm not that old, and, but I, I realized a few years ago I've lost some people. I've lost a few folks that were very very dear to me, and I've realized that I'm going to lose uh, as the years go. I'm going to lose more and more, 
And that's tough. That's a hard reality of life is dealing with loss and it's sorrow. If you've never gone through it, it'll change you when you do go through it. You'll uh, certainly have a different perspective on life when you begin to lose those that are dear to you. And you begin to think, uh, even when you get together with family and so forth, and you begin to think, I wish Grandpa could be here. I wish my sister could be here. I wish my friend could be here. I wish these people were here. And then the thought occurs to you, but they don't wish they could be here. Mm -hmm. In other words, you think they'd really enjoy this, but no, they wouldn't at all. Because they are present with the Lord. And my friend... The Bible just describes that as, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered in the heart of men the things which the Lord hath for them that love Him. And the reality of it is, that's a misquote, but the reality of it is, is that heaven is glorious. And that's the hope of the believer. It's not hope as in, uh, it's my fond desire that this would uh, be a possibility. It is hope as in, this is my future and I'm looking forward to it. That's what the word hope means. And I want us as believers to have hope. Here's another practical application I thought of. I was thinking, I'll just get practical. Um, go ahead and spend the money and buy a grave. Go ahead, spend the money and buy a grave. Just for the witness of it. Just for the witness of it. Uh, a few years ago, my mom started buying graves for her relatives. Her, her mom had just a marker and her dad had a marker. And she started making these elaborate tombstones with verses all over them. A little small cemetery. You go to Nicotoma, Kansas, you want to see some of the Thelmans buried there. And the nicest tombstones in this little cemetery are my grandparents' uh, uh, tombstones. You'd think, seeing the tombstones, they must have been somebody, but they really weren't. It's just that my mom wanted to let people know here's some bodies that are coming up out of the grave. And I uh, wanted to witness that. I wanted to have some scriptures. And so she put some nice things uh, in the cemetery there. And it means a lot to her because she's thinking about, I'm thinking somebody's calling her right now. You remember why I have my phone on, right? I made up a reason for this. But this is a fake call, so. All right. Kevin, you remember when you called me in church? <clears throat> All right. If it were you, I would have answered it. <laughs> uh, buy a piece of ground or plan a burial. You say, Pastor, cremations are way cheaper. I know. I know. They're far cheaper. But there's just no testimony in a creation. In a creation. In a cremation. There is. You say, Pastor, what if I can't afford it? Borrow money. You're going to be dead. <laughs> they get re they get I mean, come on. I mean, seriously. You've got to leave debt to somebody. Leave it in your will. Leave it to, you know, to somebody special. Leave your debt. You know? And uh, <laughs> just leave it behind. I'm serious about this, though. Hey, you, know, you say, Pastor, have you bought, your, have you bought a, a, a burial plot? Uh, very soon. I've, been, I've looked at burial plots in southeast Florida. I want to bear, get buried in southeast Florida. For one thing, I want our church to know this is where my heart is. As far as ministry goes, I'm from Kansas. We have land there. We could have a. We, my dad's thinking about doing a family burial ground and so forth. But I, I want to be buried in south Florida because this is, this is where I've called to and been called to. This is my home and so forth. But I want to be a testimony somewhere here. And so if you want to buy me a burial plot, I'd be happy to <laughs> receive it because I can't afford it either. But uh, maybe I'll go take out a loan on one. Uh, and buy it before you die because your, uh, your relatives, sometimes you would, you'd be amazed at how, how much they can be skin flints and uh, just put you in a box and burn you up just because it's cheaper and they want to keep your money. So leave them a burial plot, you know, a place they can go and visit your your grave. Now, I'm being a little silly about that, but I'm dead serious about the importance of a, of a Christian testimony. I do think that if we believe in the resurrection, and we honestly believe in the resurrection, we ought to take seriously the fact that we want people to see where we come from. You say, Pastor, what happens if you get burned up? Does that mean there's no resurrection for you? Um, you know, God's pretty amazing. He can do some pretty incredible things. It just will be less incredible coming from ashes than from a, a tombstone. It might you know, be long enough that people won't recognize you when you come out. So you'll need a label so they'll know who you are. Maybe grab your tombstone and carry it for a name tag or something like that. That could be an argument for a smaller, you know, one of the little brass plates instead of the big tombstone. <laughs> so, okay, now you know where my mind wonders when I have too much time to think about it. Okay, but the reality of it is I do think as believers is something to consider. You say, Pastor, would you judge me if, uh, if I were cremated? 
you wouldn't be around to care anyway, so don't think, don't worry about it. <laughs> but uh, no, the truth of the matter is, is that people make individual decisions. This is not something I'm forceful adamant on, but I do have an opinion. I think sometimes it's helpful to share opinions because people haven't considered some things. And I do think that this is our testimony, isn't it? That Jesus Christ is risen. Our faith is not in vain. We believe in something real. Jesus not only was risen, but He was seen of Peter. He was seen of the twelve. He was seen of more than 500 brethren who had Paul, at the writing of this letter were mostly still alive. Paul himself had seen the resurrected Jesus. The resurrection was a really big deal. And if you believe in it, it's a big deal too, isn't it? Matter of fact, it's the reason why we live. It gives us perspective in life. Sometimes I'm about to make a decision and I'm just considering options. Do I, can, should I do this or do I do this? And I don't know what to do. And then I think about the eternal ramifications of it. And the decision's like done already. So, okay, I know what the best is because I want to make a decision on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. The preaching of the apostles is not in vain. And I'm risen with Christ. And the implications of it are absolutely endless. In this life, it's not in this life only we have hope in Christ. No, we have hope forever. And we're looking forward to it. And so let's live in light of it. And let's testify to others. My friend, there are so many people who are lost and without hope. And we're not. So let's preach the gospel and let's share our hope. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. And I ask that you would encourage the truth of it. Lord, I pray that we would be ever reminded of Jesus Christ, the first fruits, and the finality of the work of the cross. And I just pray... Uh, Lord, for the questions that have been raised in minds of individuals this evening, that these would invoke a uh, careful study, and the result would be that believers would know you better because of the resurrection, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take just a couple of minutes tonight, and let's have some prayer requests before we dismiss.